welcome back to Cosmic Comics. Today I'm going to look at the origin of Annihilus and follow this up by looking at each of his early appearances prior to his showing up in the pages of the Avengers during the Kree Scroll War. His origins are revealed in Fantastic Four Volume 1, issue number 140, published in 1973. I'll eventually come back to the plot of this issue in a later episode. But all I want to focus on right now are the pages where Annihilus shares his origin story. It begins over a thousand years ago on a planet much like Earth at the core of the Negative Zone. The surface of the planet is covered in clouds of ash and mist due to extremely high volcanic activity. A myriad of beasts rise from the sea to walk on the land. The first sentient creature to come out of the muck was a young Annihilus. The closest thing to describe Annihilus to an Earth species is that of an insect, mostly because of his exoskeleton. Although, this origin story goes as far as to say Annihilus is an insect. Annihilus rises up to a cruel world. His first experience is freezing, and he begins looking for warmth. Annihilus feels isolated from the other creatures around him because he was the only one who can ask questions. Mostly, he just wants to know why he is different from anybody else. While pondering his existence, Annihilus is attacked. He runs, but everywhere he goes, he finds a hostile and inhospitable world filled with beasts who want to do nothing but kill him. Annihilus runs for days, always being hunted, and he vows that someday he will return and kill them all. Exhausted and nearing collapse, Annihilus spots an alien object on the landscape. At first, Annihilus mistakes the spaceship for a giant glowing stone. He's hoping that it might offer a good place to hide. The size of the ship is reportedly of an indescribable size and scale. As Annihilus runs into the ship, we see him passing numerous yellow canisters. Once inside, Annihilus is scared by the bodies of the dead crew, until something catches his eye. A helmet. When he first picks it up, he doesn't even know what a helmet is. The only reason he puts it on his head is that he's still cold. Once Annihilus puts on the helmet, a roar enters his brain, and his entire world changes. Annihilus is shown a vision. A voice speaks to him. He learns the story of Tyana, a now dead and forgotten world. The Tyana appear to be one of those haughty, holier-than-thou species, and... This is reflected when they say that they stood tall and proud, and tried to reach heights denied all other species. The Tyana took the seeds of life and sealed them inside golden canisters of power. They were made to ensure they would withstand the rigors of space travel as they set out to seed new life through the galaxy where they saw fit. The Tyana looked upon themselves as the masters of the universe. Hey, that's got a nice ring to it. Somebody should use that. Surprisingly, the super-advanced species put all of their eggs in one basket and sent their seed capsules all out on one single ship. The freak accident of not being capable of staying away from a group of asteroids cripple their ship. Seriously, how does such an advanced species end up in this kind of situation by mistake? Lucky for them, chance landed them on a planet, the one we find them on now. Perhaps I should have said unlucky for them. The crew finds themselves stranded. The ship's main engines are down. Maybe they could survive long enough to repair them, but their food processors were destroyed in the crash. Even though their lives are over, the crew releases life from one of the canisters onto Annihilus's planet. The crew starves to death, and the captain was the last to survive. He leaves behind their story and more. Secrets. Powers and wonders. Annihilus absorbed everything the captain had to say and realized that he now had enough power at his disposal to get his revenge on the unthinking creatures of this world. Annihilus was now the most powerful being on his planet. Over the next few centuries, Annihilus continued to grow in intelligence and strength. At some point, Annihilus stole the power of the Golden Canisters and used them to create his cosmic control rod, the source of most of his power. Also, he does this little thing where he goes on to conquer most of the Negative Zone. 
Now that we have his origin story out of the way, let's jump back in time to November of 1968 in the first appearance of Annihilus in Fantastic Four, Volume 1, Annual Number 6, written by Stan Lee. Sue Richards is at the hospital in labor, but Ben and Johnny discovered Reed Richards working in his lab. Reed informs them that both Sue and the baby are in danger due to cosmic radiation that's still in her blood. Reed is searching for the one element that can save them, but it consists of antimatter and can only be found in the negative zone. Both Ben and Johnny offer to help save Sue despite Reed's misgivings. In the end, Reed decides to take them both up on the ropper and passes an extra harness over to Ben. And now for something completely different. Within the negative zone, we are shown an insect-looking ship while being told that life within the negative zone is short, brutal, and inhumanely incomprehensible. The being who ensures life is so unbearable? A nihilist. He who annihilates. It's instantly spelled out what kind of a villain we're up against, the kind that strikes without warning or mercy. Where once there had been buildings and people is replaced with death and destruction, the ship stops and a lone hand thrusts open a hatch. From within that hatch comes forth a nihilus, the living death that walks. And, um, yeah, he doesn't look too intimidating. I think it's the slouched posture. I don't know, something about this image doesn't work for me. Annihilus claims to be the supreme being in the universe who is forever reborn through the destruction of life. And there you have it, the introduction of Annihilus to the Marvel Universe. Back at the lab, Johnny, Ben, and Reed are ready to enter the chamber leading to the negative zone. The three of them then make the leap through the barrier. Once out the other side, Reed informs everybody that they will need a few minutes for their eyes to readjust themselves to the alien images around them. Johnny lets us know that he doesn't need a harness like the other two because any dangerous antimatter particles will flow through him once he flames on. And yeah, things start looking trippy inside the negative zone. While traveling along, Reed is snatched by an unknown foe. Ben and Johnny give chase. Johnny is capable of using his flame to slow the creature down, but has to keep his distance in order not to hurt Reed. Reed, on the other hand, wants to know what the creature's motives are and where it's taking them. The beast flies towards a barren planetoid. Once they are close enough, the scavenger hurls Reed into a circular device which holds onto him like a magnet and begins pulling him towards the center of the planet. It then deposits Reed into a cell with several other alien species. Back at the hospital, Medusa discovers that the doctors know what Reed has already found out. Sue's blood is contaminated with cosmic radiation, placing both mother and child's life at risk. Ben and Johnny land on the planetoid right behind Reed, but can't figure out where he disappeared. Before the two of them can come up with a plan of attack, a large glass globe comes up from the ground and captures them. With each of our heroes captured, we turn back to Annihilus who is praising his scavenger for hunting down three specimens that exhibit both intelligence and power. He notes that these three could have been more dangerous, but are helpless now that they are caught. What motivates a being of such vast power as Annihilus? Annihilus believes the greatest way to protect his cosmic control rod is destroying all living creatures. The control rod is the source of his power and immortality. In the end, Annihilus' philosophy is one of self-preservation via elimination of all competition. Annihilus doesn't doubt his superiority for a second. He goes on to take a look at his prisoners and flies right into their cage without fear. He tells him to back off as he looks for the new prisoner from another world. Note that Reed no longer has his harness on. Reed can understand what Annihilus is saying, so Annihilus must be using some form of universal translator. Reed punches Annihilus. Man, I hate it when the good guys are the first ones to resort to violence. Reed rises up and proclaims he's going to complete his mission. 
Annihilus finds this amusing and wants to know more about this mission. He easily brushes Reed backward. While on the ground, Annihilus makes the mistake of bragging about his cosmic control rod. And wouldn't you know it, that's what Reed wants to steal to save his wife and unborn child. The one element in all the universe that can save his wife is strapped to Annihilus' chest. Annihilus uses his cosmic control rod in a show of power, killing everything in the room except for Reed and himself in making them completely disappear. Reed is focused on the control rod like a zombie who just saw his first skull full of brains. Annihilus lets Reed know that it is he who rules entire galaxies within the negative zone. This is his realm, and he is the master. He then pushes Reed into a cell with Johnny and Ben. The three are happy to be reunited. Ben wants to know who took their harnesses. Reed tells him about Annihilus and that he's wearing what they need to save Sue. Johnny's ready to go on the attack, but Reed lets him know that for the time being, Annihilus is running the show. As if on cue, Annihilus arrives to annihilate all three of them. Annihilus doesn't want to see three interesting test subjects go to waste, and as such, he is going to test the extent of their powers as he kills them. I love the artwork here. Our heroes attempt to escape. Reed stretches his body to block Annihilus' view, while Ben and Johnny attempt to destroy the walls of their cell to no avail. Annihilus correctly assesses that their powers are brute strength, blame, and elasticity. He continues his attack by dropping in a giant boot. This is followed by a giant gyro saw slicing towards Reed from out of the wall. And I love this next foe. Johnny is attacked by an all-engulfing sonic sponge, which is a thick, fire-extinguishing mass, which sounds like an idea that got rejected for a D&D monster manual. The mass is gaining on Johnny when he decides to do what Reed would do and think about it. Consider any weak points the creature might have. Why wouldn't he do that anyway? He shoots fire at the sponge's eye. He beats the sponge by pouring flame on the one spot that can see him and isn't fire resistant. Johnny then saves Reed by melting the gyro saw. The two of them attempt to help Ben, but he shows that he was just resting and doesn't need their help. He then breaks the boot off from its base and uses it to smash out the paneling between them and Annihilus. The force of Ben's blast has knocked Annihilus out. Reed leaps in and carefully removes the cosmic control rod. Mind you, this is the equivalent of taking the ring away from Gollum. Reed notes that the rod contains some circuitry that will need decoded later, but is distracted when Johnny points out a fully automated rail plane which they will use to make their escape. Once they climb aboard, Johnny is surprised that there is no control panel. Reed, on the other hand, has figured things out and starts using his mind on the cosmic control rod to direct control of the ship. Annihilus wakes up and immediately notes that he was foolish for not killing the invaders right away. In his next breath, he realizes that his cosmic control rod is gone. He gets very dramatic about the whole thing. I find this panel pretty funny. He's just realized that the control rod is gone, and now he turns... And let's loose that line. My rail plane! That too is gone! Oh, it's, it's great. I feel like that was the last straw. It comes across as the greater of the two indignities due to its pettiness. This also reveals my biggest problem with Annihilus as a villain. He often comes across as somewhat slapstick to me, and I'm never certain if this is intended or not. He also sort of reminds me of what Starscream might be like if he ever took over the Decepticons for good. This is the realm where Annihilus rules, and as such, he springs a trap to keep the Fantastic Four on the planet forever. He lets loose the supremely bestial boars. He literally throws a switch, and it arouses an uncontrollable horde of boars who can chomp through just about anything like a knife through butter. 
he unleashes enough of these that his sonic shock vibrates through the planet. I mean, who the heck has a horde of supremely bestial boars on standby? Either the negative zone makes no sense, or Annihilus is just one of the most balling gangsters ever. I bet he feels 100% justified on this expense. You know that everybody else, even his fellow supervillains, told him that the supremely bestial boars were a bad idea and against all odds, but it's a chance he had to take. Take a good look at him now. To make things more insane, the creatures are actually attracted to the vibrations of the ship Annihilus would be on if the good guys hadn't stolen it. The supremely bestial boars attack the rail plane and our heroes have to abandon ship. Johnny attempts to fight them off, but soon they are outnumbered. Reed recognizes that their only chance of escape is to see if he can use the cosmic control rod to get them out of there. It starts working, and Reed creates a shield of cosmic force before levitating them all towards the planet's surface. While they tunnel towards the surface, their progress is being tracked by Annihilus. And wow, that is a big gun. And not just a gun. It's a flying gunship made of the most potent weapon of all whose speed is unmatched by anything that lives. What does a ship like that say about a man? Hmm. Annihilus leaves prepared to destroy anything in order to retrieve his cosmic control rod. Once again, in this four-panel sequence, I'm not certain that Annihilus is supposed to come across as humorous, but he maintains a certain endearing, egotistical buffoonery about him. In my head, everything he says always sounds like it's being spoken by Cobra Commander from the original G.I. Joe series. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and give it a listen. He prepares to shoot our three heroes and lines up the shot, and unlike Cobra Commander, Annihilus lands his shot. Our heroes are hit, their shield is down, and they are tumbling through space. Reed uses his elasticity to rope in his companions. He sees Annihilus coming in from behind and for another shot. Reed uses the cosmic control rod to dodge the incoming missile. He then uses the rod to send the missile back towards Annihilus. Reed suggests that they take a minute to get their bearings, and as the missile explodes, Reed recognizes that the rocks around him as being the same place he was stuck last time he visited the Negative Zone. Our heroes are near the center of the Negative Zone, where space is transformed into antimatter. If they stand their current rock too long, they will explode. Reed attempts to use the cosmic control rod, but since the energy in this area is totally neutralized, it won't work. For the same reason, Johnny's flame won't do them any good. Reed considers what they should do. None of this matters once Annihilus opens fire on our heroes. His gunship was destroyed, but he still managed to pilot an armored section of ship through space to their current location. He wants that cosmic control rod so bad. He comes in blasting, and the poor guy, Reed Richard uses his arm as a lasso and snatches Annihilus' gun away from him. Reed is convinced that without his gun, Annihilus can't hurt them. Johnny starts to pout about the situation, and Annihilus begs to have his control rod returned to him. Ben even goes as far as to say Reed should give it back to him just to make him shut up. Yeah, not a good idea, man. Reed laments that everything depends on if there is a way to drain the energy within the cosmic control rod, and adding to the humor, Annihilus then informs us that the cosmic control rod has a nozzle at the tip that will drain its energy, but because of course it does. Reed then tells Annihilus that he can have the cosmic control rod back in return for his and Ben's harnesses, because I'm sure... Annihilus made certain to load those up after his ship exploded and when he went chasing off after these three. And of course he did. He has them in hand, ready to turn over. Reed, fortunately, has an empty vial on his belt that is capable of attaching to the nozzle on the cosmic control rod and drain some of its energy into a vial. And none of that, nothing, not a zilch, makes any sense. Annihilus, desperate to get his hands back on the cosmic control rod, 
tosses the harnesses down to Ben and Reed, who immediately put them on without completing their portion of the bargain. Annihilus is getting fed up with Reed, who says they will toss the canister over as soon as they are in the clear. Their harnesses begin working and pushing our heroes away from the antimatter. As they fly away, Reed turns around and flings a cosmic control rod towards Annihilus, who is capable of resisting the pull of the antimatter due to his body chemistry and his wings. The run-in with Annihilus scares Reed enough that he says he plans to seal off the entrance to the negative zone forever once he returns home. The enemy is gone, and our heroes have gotten their quest item. All that's left to do is go home and save the princess. A short time later, our heroes cross back over into our world and return to the hospital. Little else is made of the cosmic cure beside Reed wondering if perhaps they got it there too late. But after a short wait, Reed is informed that he is now the proud father of a young baby boy. With the good news, the delivery room turns into a celebration for a few minutes before our heroes head down the hall to visit mother and child. Reed and crew then head in to visit the newest member of the Richards family. In the Fantastic Four, Volume 1, Issue Number 108, published in 1971, the Negative Zone comes up once again. Janus, a college friend of Reed Richards, has spent decades experimenting with and learning how to harness the energy of the Negative Zone. Eventually, this leads to Janus exhibiting a split personality, one that represents the evil portions of himself. With the help of Reed Richards, Janus is capable of seemingly killing his evil side. Over time, Janus uses the power of the negative zone to heal himself, but he keeps searching for more power until he possesses enough nega power that he can be protected when crossing over into the negative zone. Reed brings Janus to his lab, unaware that Janus is still fighting against his inner demons. While there, Reed shows Janus' visit screen view into the negative zone. Janus then attacks Reed and forces his way into the negative zone. The Thing is ready to bring Janus back before he or Earth attracts the attention of anything within the negative zone, but it's too late. Something has already located the open portal between Reed's lab and the negative zone. The first issue of this arc ends with Annihilus approaching. Fantastic Four, Volume 1, Issue 109 opens with Janus facing off against Annihilus inside of the Negative Zone, while the Fantastic Four watch from a busy scanner within Reed's lab. Reed realizes the greatest danger is if Annihilus discovers how to leave the Negative Zone and enter our world. They must enter the Negative Zone to stop both Janus and Annihilus. Meanwhile, back in the Negative Zone, Janus and Annihilus meet. Janus wants to make a show of force to express how much control he has in the negative zone, so he changes his outfit. Annihilus is not impressed. Janus doubles down and sends a blast of power showering over Annihilus, but it does nothing. Janus starts getting worried and demands to know who this being is. When I read this, I think of Bane and Batman. Oh, you think the negative zone is your ally? But you merely adopted the negative zone. I was born in it. Molded by it. And once again, I find Annihilus more funny than intimidating as he screams his title at Janus. Back at the lab, Reed pulls out his harness for the negative zone. Sue wants to go with them, but Reed refuses to take her with them, afraid that this time they might not come back but he has to do it because if Annihilus breaks through to Earth within minutes, all life on Earth could come to an end as the forces of nature run wild across the planet's surface. Before leaving, Reed gives each of them a gyro homing device as he insists that Sue remain at the visit screen because she'll be their only contact with Earth. As our heroes prepare to enter the negative zone, things are not going good for Janus who has been knocked off of his rock with a mere gesture. Annihilus comes in for the kill, but Janus pleads for his life, promising to tell Annihilus how to destroy the human race. He also offers how to show Annihilus the way back to Earth. Annihilus is intrigued by this offer. He spares Janus's life with the understanding that billions of humans will die so that he might live. Annihilus is most interested in his revenge on the Fantastic Four. On their way into the final chamber, 
we learn that Reed's harness has a stun bolt blaster attached to it that is supposed to be strong enough to stun Annihilus. Once more, the Fantastic Four cross over the barrier into the negative zone. Almost as soon as they arrive, they find what they are looking for. This place must not be very big because everybody seems capable of finding everybody else so fast here. Our heroes land and Reed attempts to listen in on their conversation. Once Reed discovers that Annihilus still doesn't know how to get to Earth, Reed instructs the team to attack. Annihilus instructs Janice to take cover inside of the ship while he takes care of the Fantastic Four. The first thing he does is extinguish the Human Torch. This also takes Ben out of action, who has to move quickly to catch the falling Johnny. Annihilus follows this up by tossing a boulder at the thing, who punches it right back, only to see it break apart against Annihilus' field of force. <sighs> Don't be difficult, it's a force field. Sue watches the story unfold in horror, incapable of warning her husband, brother, and friend of the dangers all around them. Then the phone rings. Oddly, it's Agatha Harkness calling because Sue hasn't stopped by to pick up the baby. This causes Sue to have a <laughs> bit of a mental breakdown, but she decides to stand at her post instead of fetching her child. In the negative zone, Janice has successfully escaped, but he's flying in the direction of the antimatter zone. Reed flies off in an attempt to intercept him while Ben takes on the brunt of Annihilus's blows. Johnny recognizes that he needs to distract Annihilus and hits him with a full-intensity flame. Annihilus disappears within the flames and reappears above them, brandishing his cosmic control rod. Instead of fighting his enemies directly, Annihilus chooses to summon a large beast to kill off Ben and Johnny. The creature ends up grabbing both of them. Ben is in one of those periods where he can turn back to his normal self. He does this which allows him to slip out of the beast's grasp. That doesn't make much sense, but whatever. Reed continues his escape while Johnny and Ben continue to try and distract Annihilus. And once again, Reed Richards is floating on the rocks above the antimatter zone. Reed Richards can't believe how far Janice is going. Aboard the ship, even Annihilus' lackeys are getting nervous about where Janice is taking them. Janice is so hungry to get closer to the center of the negative zone that he pushes out an extension ramp from the ship to get himself 50 or 60 feet closer. As he begins to feel the nega power flow through him, the lackeys inside start pulling the ship back. This enrages Janice, who thinks that they are attempting to stop his power from rivaling that of Annihilus. Janice shoots the two lackeys and takes over the controls of the ship. Unknown to him, behind him one of the lackeys pulls a switch. The switch ejects Janice from the craft and he begins falling towards the exploding atmosphere. Reed reaches out in one last desperate attempt to save Janice. The two are unable to connect. Janice gains the power he sought, but he can't escape the gravitational pull. Reed is forced to turn back before the same thing happens to him. Reed, his harness low on fuel, makes his way back to Ben and Johnny. Meanwhile, the fight continues. Ben manages to send Annihilus tumbling with one punch and takes out the large alien creature with another. Annihilus has finished playing with his food, but that's when Reed arrives and starts shooting a series of stun bolt blasts which should give the three of them time to escape. Reed makes certain that Ben and Johnny have their gyro devices, which will ensure they are capable of returning home. Reed's thoughts tell us that he lost his at some point in the battle. Ben and Johnny return, but everybody wants to know why Reed wasn't behind them. Sue looks out on the busy screen, but can't see Reed anywhere. He's lost to them for the moment. Reed is currently on his favorite set of floating rocks once more. The story arc wraps up in Fantastic Four, Volume 1, Issue Number 110. I've got a bit of an issue with this first page. Reed states that he can't go home without his gyro device. No biggie checks out, but then he says, I gave it to Johnny so that he would survive. That's not what happened at all. In the previous issue, he said that he lost his gyro during battle. As he hurtles towards his doom, Reed tries to think of a way out of his current predicament. Back at the lab, Sue cries, Johnny comforts, and Ben pouts, but none of them can think of any way to help Reed. On his way down, Reed remembers that he has superpowers and decides to use them. 
he turns his body into a sail and floats away. Still, Rita's stuck. On one side, he's got certain death via antimatter, but if he goes too far in the other direction, he's got a nihilist standing there with a horde of creatures ready to attack. A nihilist decides to put Reed's fate off as long as possible because the longer he struggles, the more likely someone is to come and help him. And if they do that, a nihilist might be capable of discovering the path to Earth. The three remaining members of the Fantastic Four seem resigned to the fact that Reed is going to die. Ben is already planning on how to take over the leadership role. While all this is going on, Agatha Harkness has shown up with baby Franklin. She insists that the boy wanted to see his mother and inquires about the location of Reed. Agatha is willing to take the child back once she hears about what is going on. Sue accuses Ben of acting coldly, but Ben insists that Reed didn't see him as anything more than a stooge and that now things are going to change around here. Sue then moves in with a little bit of domestic violence and strikes Ben across the face while screaming that she hates him. Ben, justifiably so, becomes enraged and points out the fact that Sue's lucky she's a female. All the same, he's done being a patsy for the Storm family. Johnny then threatens to go after Ben, but Sue holds him back and reminds Johnny that Reed said Ben's ability to change back into a human had somehow affected him. Wow, I know Ben said some cold things, but Sue fails to take any responsibility for her actions and completely ignores her own physical assault on a friend and co-worker. Johnny and Sue push all that under the rug and focus their attentions on retrieving Reed. As they formulate their plan, Ben comes back in to prove what a good leader he would be by being a team player. Johnny encapsulates one of the gyros inside of a protective ball of flame, which he carries through the negative zone portal while encased inside of one of Sue's protective barriers while she holds onto his feet and Ben holds onto her feet so that Johnny can reach far enough into the negative zone to toss the gyro homing device as a fireball to Reed Richards. Wow, the number of questions I have and the number of places this story falls apart at this moment is astounding. And he does it. Johnny gives a good pitch. Do you have any idea how insane that is? Go outside, put up a target 20 or 30 feet away, and try to hit it with a ball. Now try to do that in outer space at a moving target miles away. Oh, and you only get one pitch. A nihilist sees the fireball and attempts to track it back to its source. All three of our heroes are almost pulled completely into the negative zone, but Ben is capable of tugging them all back to Earth before a nihilist sees them. The torch's flame bolt reaches Reed, who is capable of retrieving the gyro, but he refuses to use it as long as he's under the watchful eye of a nihilist. A nihilist has sent his hordes to seek out Reed, who attempts to hide behind a small asteroid. It doesn't take long before he's seen. A nihilist pushes a full-on attack and Reed begins stretching himself out as thin as possible. While the rest of the Fantastic Four watch in horror, Johnny requests that Agatha take Sue from the room so she doesn't have to watch, but Agatha tells them to fetch her a candle and a piece of chalk. She lets them know that she might be capable of saving Reed. They are all instructed to remain silent during her ritual. And, sure enough, all three of them end up talking. Agatha whips up a wind that is felt all across New York City. Reed has reached his limit. He has contracted his body to the point in which he can no longer keep up with the strain. It is at that moment that Reed thinks perhaps he has gone crazy. The sky is filled with Reed Richardses. There are suddenly millions and millions of him. Since Annihilus is incapable of focusing on all the Reed Richards, the real one is given a chance to activate his gyro and escape without revealing the path back to Earth to Annihilus. Sue and Johnny are happy to have Reed back, and all three celebrate Agatha's spell. Ben, on the other hand, wants his contribution to the team recognized as well. Alicia thinks that Ben is being a little bit too harsh, but Ben wants none of it. In fact, he thinks he can do better than Alicia, tells her he doesn't need her anymore, and breaks up with her. From there, a brawl breaks out among the Fantastic Four, but I've covered what I came to talk about. Annihilus' origin story and early appearances. 
This episode gives us the context we need to understand who the character is prior to his appearance in the Kree Skrull War. Thanks for watching Cosmic Comics. Feel free to hit any of the buttons below. I'm out.